Hey everyone, Eric Thompson here. Welcome back to the channel, and as always, you know what I'm going to say. Hope that you are doing well. Today, we'll be right along with the AFI Top 100 review, considering number 82, but I'm going to double check because I'm tired of asking Vegas to do everything for me in fact checking. It is number 82, 1926's Sunrise. Wow. It's quite simply told. The story about a man who's in love with a woman who's not his wife and how he gets unin love with that woman and back in love with his wife. And as you can imagine, there is a sunrise. Why is this film on the AFI Top 100? Well, if I'm not mistaken, this is the oldest film on the AFI Top 100, 1926. Wow. And this film is in, uh, is in black and white. And it is silent, okay? Uh, not silent in the strictest sense. There is music, really a very beautiful orchestral score, very cinematic, of course, uh, very dramatic. Uh, but there are also sound effects, you know, uh, cars and clapping and, and even human voices, you know. As perhaps you understand that in these times, it's not that they were unable to put audio to moving picture, but that it was such a technical challenge, it was easier just to put in the titles. Of course, titles referring to the screens when you see the text only, um, the, either the narration or the spoken dialogue written out on a tile. And so here, um, Sunrise, you know, a prime example of uh, the give and take between a score and sound effects but also using tiles and, and uh, you know putting dialogue out in that respect. Absolutely, this film is relevant to today because of its innovation. I know I say that word a lot, but this film truly uh, deserves our attention. Um, the silent film era began, you know, in the 1890s. Okay, and so by this time, 30 years later, we're pretty much at the end of what we consider the silent film era, okay? 1927, 1928 is, is really the end of things. And so when we get into those last three or four years, the silent films we get are gonna be of the highest quality because directors will have been making them for a while. And that's what we have here, a film that shows the experience and genius of a seasoned uh, director and also incredibly talented actors. Going back, if I could, just to touch, I, I want to also say that, of course, that's why it's relevant because of the innovation, but this is another reason why this, this film belongs on the AI Top 100. I was watching it, and never having seen it before, I was struck by some of the technical devices that were used by the director, and I, I knew in my mind, I said, gosh, this uh, could not have been used beforehand, <laughs> but it's been used about a million times after the fact, you know, in so many movies that we love today. Um, among them, forced perspective. If you don't know what that is, I keep using that term. If you don't know what forced perspective is, here's a simple picture to help you out, okay? That's <laughs> that's what forced perspective. Forcing something into perspective with another object or person. So forcing someone or something into perspective with another object or person. Because these two things are obviously not the same size, but with a forced perspective image, they look either the same size or, you see what I mean, very good. Thank you. So, a lot of that use here. Uh, really incredible tracking shots in this film for a time when, I mean, they obviously had track, but how good was it, how effective was it, who knows? And so that's a, a very strong innovation that obviously plays out. I mean, it has... Un untellable value in the rest of cinematic history. Tracking uh, shots do, of course. Some of our favorite movies have lots of them, lots of tracking shots in them. The set pieces are also amazing. And using, again, forced perspective to make, you know, sets in the background seem huge, even though they're small, and so you have models and miniatures and bigatures kind of at use there. Um, really a, a, a splendid, splendid film. And even beyond that, beyond technical innovation, which is a great reason for it to be on the list, um, you know, the, the actors 
really just the husband and wife, but the other lady as well, the woman in the night or whatever her name is, they don't have names in the story. And so that is also <laughs> a very strong poetic device, you know, like could be any of us, these people. Um, their acting is incredible, of course, because they have to communicate so much emotion, truth, plot, without saying a single word, uh, if you can imagine. And that's precisely what, what I'm looking at in sort of the reflection spiritual element of this film, watching it and marveling at, uh, and I don't want to get her name wrong, the, uh, the, the actress, <laughs> Janet Gaynor, uh, George O'Brien and Janet Gaynor star, Margaret Livingston is the other lady. But I'm marveling at Gaynor and how expressive she is and how believable she is. I, I feel that she doesn't need words. And of course, a lot of things are, are obvious and they're meant to be. I just went and saw a ballet uh, this afternoon. It was a wonderful performance. And of course, no spoken word there, not a whole word during the whole performance. Music was wonderful though. But of course, the you know the dancers have to exaggerate every movement so that we understand without a doubt what it is that they are trying to communicate to us you know in the audience uh, and that's part of what i reflected on was how in the christian life the spiritual life we're called to live an active life of discipleship just discipleship in jesus christ i'm sorry i'm very tired very very tired but we're going to start with slur um i'll say it again though I reflected on how in the Christian life we're called to live an active life of discipleship to Jesus Christ. And that means um, if we don't get to use words, if we don't have the chance to use words, do our actions, do our lives, do our, does our living reflect Jesus Christ? There's a, a tremendous passage from Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica <laughs> in 2 Thessalonians. And... Uh, this is what he says. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. So keep away from the unrighteous, really. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. The screen was made. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. That's pretty harsh. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. You ever th come, come, come across a person, you have a person who's like that, who doesn't seem to be doing anything, but always seems to be busy. <laughs> Isn't that curious? That seems like it's a sign of the times. Continuing, verse 12. Now such persons we command and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Really strong, challenging words here from, uh, from St. Paul, especially in how we live lives and how we have relationships and how that immediately testifies to our lives as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ. A lot of people struggle with these verses for that very reason. No one wants to believe that God is saying, don't hang out with that person, don't be friends with that person, don't associate yourself with this person, so on and so forth. You know, because we believe that you know, we're, in a, we're in a communal life, we live together, we breathe together, we, we work together, we play together, and so we should be able to have friends who are of different convictions. Well. I don't believe that's what this passage is saying, that you can't have friends that aren't Catholic or Protestant or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Mormon or whatever, all right? But what Paul is saying is that do not let your activity, your behavior become unruly, okay?
okay? Do not do the unrighteous things that your unrighteous friends might do. Have friends of all kinds, but do not join in their behavior. And that's precisely, you know, in, in some respect, what's happening in these silent films, okay? The director is saying to the actors, look, you have to communicate this incredible range of emotion with your action. You don't get words, okay? You can talk to me, you can talk to each other, but you can't talk to the audience. They're just watching you, all right? So do your best. And in some respect, while we do have the voice of evangelization, while we do have words to express our faith and to express the love of God to others, the bottom line is action, behavior. Do we act in a way that reflects the love of Jesus Christ? And do we, do we reflect it in such a way that people know what we're about, that they understand what we're trying to do? If, I mean, if you turned off your speakers right now to your computer and you watch this video, would you know what I'm talking about? Jesus? Would you know I'm talking about a, a movie? Well, I guess you can see the text on the screen. But you see what I mean, okay? That the witness of our faith be a truly active one, okay? I want to leave that citation up on the screen for just a, a, a few more seconds. I want you guys to check that out. Once again, 2 Thessalonians 3. I read 6 through 14, uh, but that's pretty much the whole of that chapter. There's a little bit beforehand and a couple of verses after. Simple reflection for this video, okay? Coming up next, number 81. We're almost done with the 80s, moving along really well. Spartacus, okay? And then I believe the Wild Bunch is after that. I'm also going to link in the description to a video I just filmed about what I call the book-to-page differential, okay? It got a really awesome response on Facebook. I want to thank everyone who posted there. Quite a few folks did, and at length. Because of that interest, I want to move with that. And so just stay tuned to the channel for that. Um, it's something that I like to talk about. Tori, of course, she definitely likes to talk about that because she has so so much read knowledge okay she reads so many books and i watch a lot of movies and so we kind of meet in the middle with that kind of conversation you know what all happens when you take a book and turn it into a film you're trying to adapt how faithful or unfaithful is it what do you think how do you feel about it so on and so forth that's coming up link in the description below as always my friends i do truly truly thank you for watching like and subscribe if you care to Welcome to the new subscribers. As always, I hope that you're enjoying the channel. Please click, click around. Feel free to take a self-guided tour of what this channel has to offer. And truly, my friends, hope that you are doing very well indeed. Thanks. See you soon.